Seekers. And before we get started, I want to mention that was the song Manchester, England uh, from the musical Hair from the 60s. Uh, and the reason, uh, before I get into my regular spiel that I want to talk about today, the reason I sang the song Manchester, England is because I will be in Manchester, England on August 19th and 20th, 2023. And uh, I was supposed to have uh, a gig out there. I was supposed to have an all-day Zazen thing and I think another uh, lecture on the next day uh, that I was going to do. And the guy who was setting that up for me flaked out, like totally flaked out more, flaked out more thoroughly than anybody has ever flaked out on any gig that I've set up in Europe in the past 11 years. Like completely ghosted me. So... I've paid for everything, though. I, I, I have transportation, a train out to Manchester. I have an Airbnb in Manchester, paid for, can't cancel it. I have a flight out of Manchester uh, for my next destination, which is Helsinki, Finland. So I got to be in Manchester. So I'm going to be in Manchester August 19th and 20th, whether I like it or not. Uh, and I do like Manchester. But do, does anybody re out there remember me? from Manchester. I've met a bunch of people there. This wouldn't be the first time I've been to Manchester, uh, but I'm really bad with names and, and faces and contacts and stuff. So if anybody wants to contact me about setting up anything, like just anything at all, in Manchester for August 19th and 20th, I know it's short notice, doesn't have to be great. Uh, but uh, but I'd love, I'd love to uh, get something uh, set up for Manchester. So I'm not just like hanging out in Manchester going to I know there's a Forbidden Planet store uh, downtown, and uh, there's a record store called FOP that I like a lot, and there's another record store I forgot the name of that I like a lot. That's all I know in Manchester. So uh, so if anybody wants to help me out in Manchester, please hit me up. Uh, go to the... Uh, you can rate me at the uh, at the uh, email that you're seeing on the screen, bw at hardcorezen.info, and maybe we can set something up. Okay, now on to today's topic. So for today's actual topic, I want to talk about something that everybody gets excited about, and it is meditation as science. Can you see it there on the screen? Uh, this, is a, this is a topic that is covered in this book that I've been talking about on and off uh, a couple of times on this channel called Buddhist Modernism. And it's, it's a topic that seems to, as I say, get people pretty excited. I get all kinds of emails from people uh, telling me about some scientific study about meditation and the benefits of meditation. And, uh, you know, I know the Dalai Lama is really into it. And uh, I know Deepak Chopra is really into it. And all the people who go talk about meditation on TV are really into it. And I'm going to give you my opinions about it after I read you what it says in this here book. Now, the section on meditation as science, I think, is pretty interesting. So it starts off with a another sort of chapterlet that's just a, just a page and a half long called Meditation as Object of Science. And let me read the first sentence of it uh, so we can get an idea what we're talking about. The rationalist conception of the human being as something to be worked on through self-observation and discipline, disciplined ordering of the elements of the psyche was a necessary pre-understanding for the new approach to Buddhist meditation. Yet it remained largely in the background until recent empirical studies of meditation in the lab. And it goes on to talking about these different scientific studies that were done uh, to see if meditation was effective and a lot of them came out and said it was. I remember hearing about this one when I first started. Tim, my first Zen teacher, mentioned this one. It says, now, scientific studies of meditation began in the 1960s when Japanese researchers conducted extensive electroencephalographic studies of Zen meditators. Uh, recording changes in alpha and theta waves, etc., etc. Their studies suggested that Zazen promotes a quiescent but alert state in which the mind is calm but also responsive to various stimuli. And I remember Tim talking about this, and apparently they this is this is the way I, my jumbled memory remembers what he said. So I don't even want to blame Tim for saying this. is This is just the way I remember it. Something like they were testing different types of meditation. And a more Hindu type meditation or TM would give you this quiescent state, but you were kind of 
zoned out you weren't alert to anything the way they were testing this was to see how whether people noticed the ticking of a clock or something like that that they would introduce and the TM people didn't notice the ticking of the clock but the Zen people would have the same sort of uh, brain wave levels uh, indicating a meditative state as the TM people but they would also register each tick of the clock so they were aware of, of what was going on more than the TM people. Now, as I say, I've garbled that because it's just something I heard 30 years ago that Tim probably heard 10 years before that and then I'm remembering it. So I don't want to put, you know, any money on that being the actual case. But that's, you know, these kind of studies were out there. Uh, so that's the kind of main point I wanted to make with that. But the next thing the author goes into is meditation as science, like whether meditation itself is a kind of science or a kind of scientific pursuit. And I'll read you some of what he said. I, I really would like to read the whole chapter because it's good, but that's going to bog everybody down. So I'll just read parts of it. The reputation of Buddhism as generally compatible with science was an important part of its entry into the discourses of modernity. The conception of meditation as itself a species of scientific activity has attained increasing visibility in contemporary Buddhist literature. Uh, skipping ahead, the popular distinction between religion and spirituality inherits one way of talking about this distinction. Religions have to do with belief, ritual, hierarchy, and maintenance of community, while spirituality and mysticism have to do with the direct, unmediated, and individual experience of the divine, an experience that transcends religion's external forms. I'm giving you the scare quotes with my fingers here. Uh, and it says... Meditative inquiry on this model aims not to reinforce traditional beliefs bound to parochial religious traditions, but to discern the reality of things through experience. Uh, and not, not as a matter of belief or not as a matter of reinforcing belief. And here is a quote from Lama Govinda who says this about the relationship between science and mysticism. He says, This common basis of all schools of Buddhism rests on experience, that is, on that area where science and mysticism meet. The only difference between those two fields of experience is that the truth of science being directed toward external objects is objectively provable or better demonstrable, whereas mysticism being directed toward the subject rests on subjective, in quotes, experience. And he said that in 1989. And here's another quote. Uh, let's see. Tibetan teacher Dzogchen Ponlop Rinpoche, uh, he says, Buddhist spiritual teachings represent a genuine science of mind that allows one to uncover the nature of the mind and the phenomena that our mind experiences. When we say that Buddhism is a science, in quotes, we do not mean the dry science of analyzing material things. We are talking about something much deeper. We are talking about, that's what she said, uh, we are talking about going into the depths of the reality of our inner world. In this sense, Buddhist spirituality is not what is ordinarily meant by the term religion. And another quote, uh, this is from Alan Wallace. Uh, I'm not sure who he is, but uh, he says, Buddhism, like science, presents itself as a body of systematic knowledge about the natural world, and it posits a wide array of testable hypotheses and theories concerning the nature of the mind and its relation to the physical environment. These theories have allegedly been tested and experientially confirmed numerous times over the past 2,500 years by means of duplicable meditative techniques. And that's a nice quote. And they, uh, they go on to say a bunch of things, and they're quite interesting, but I don't want to make this video immensely long, so I'm going to skip over. But uh, it continues with a brief critique of meditation as science. And the main line that I highlighted for myself in here is this. For the ancients, and in more traditional contexts today, meditation was not so much a method of self-discovery, but a tool for reversing the causal processes 
of birth and rebirth in order to bring about a complete cessation of suffering and attain full awakening. It also generated supernatural capabilities as well as good karma propelling the practitioner toward better rebirths. More than just a solitary practice, as noted, it is usually tied to the social system. And he gives some examples. He kind of goes on and on, but I'm just going to cut to the chase and read you the, the last line, which I, which I really like, because it, 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 it contains a caveat that I think is interesting. It says, It therefore, uh, Buddhism, operates within the constraints of tradition and the authority of the past in ways that science in theory does not and i like the way they put in theory there and they put in theory in uh, what do we call that italics uh, you probably can't see that but that's what it is so that's real interesting stuff and i just wanted to make some brief comments about it because i think the 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 thing is when i was reading that whole paragraph because it takes some like a, a, a very, very long paragraph before they get to that line about science in theory does not, where they talk about how Buddhism operates within the constraints of the theory of Buddhism, the ideas of Buddhism, which are karma and rebirth and and uh, so on and so forth. We talked about it in when I was reading it. So the, it, it operates within a tradition, and what you find through your meditative practice is supposed to, at least this is what they say, confirm the tradition and that there is some complaint that it's not as objective as science because science is supposed to be open-ended and doesn't conform to any tradition uh, at all and just looks at the natural world as it is uh, but buddhism is bound by the tradition of buddhism the traditional explanations of how things happen and why they happen and what a person is and what the universe is and so on and so forth well, yeah, but I love the way they put that in theory because I, I feel like in a lot of important ways, science also operates within the bounds of a very specific worldview, the materialistic worldview. And I know there are scientists who are trying to kind of see uh, past that worldview and see if there isn't some way to test whether that worldview itself is true. Uh, uh, Donald Hoffman being one of the you know, my favorite examples of somebody who's trying to, to do that and work towards that in a scientific way. So yeah, I, 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 I do agree that it is probably a mistake to talk about meditation or Buddhist meditation or Zazen specifically, if you want to talk about what I'm into, uh, as science. Uh, this always annoyed me when I first came across it because it was a big thing for people to do when I first got into meditation. The Hare Krishnas, who were my first uh, group that I flirted with uh, in, in trying to get into Eastern spirituality, were really, really big on calling everything that they did science. And they, the, the word science was, was all over every Hare Krishna uh, piece of literature, every book, every magazine, every talk they did was always about how this was science and, and stuff. And, and, and it, it's very big in, in a lot of the Buddhist world, too, to talk about the science of it and all this stuff but i this kind of thing never really appealed to me the i didn't i, I know that it's a, a it's a gateway for a lot of people i know that a lot of people get into meditation specifically because they read somewhere that it's scientific you know that science has proven meditation is good for you and then and then they're always quoting the different studies and whatnot that that come out to try to say that science agrees that meditation is good for you or that this doctor or that doctor thinks it's good for you and so forth that kind of thing just personally talking personally never never did much for me i was actually more interested in that so-called traditional that traditionalist worldview and everything because i growing up uh, this isn't something I talk about too much, but I'd had some experiences even as a child uh, which made me question the sort of hard material outlook that most people believe in. And I don't want to go into too much detail about that. You know, I'll let you, I'll leave it to your imagination, but it was nothing spectacular. But there were things that happened to me and things I noticed as a child which made me think, oh, this world doesn't really work exactly the way they think it does. Or at least uh, I don't believe that. I can't believe that. So 
you know, one of the things was, one of the things that got me interested in it was I heard about this other worldview, that there were other ways of looking at what reality was. And I wanted to see whether some of those could be true. And as I said, when I when it got to the Hare Krishnas, I was like, oh, this is kind of a bunch of BS. <laughs> I couldn't really uh, follow their worldview. But I did, uh, when I found Zen, I liked that worldview. And, and one of the things I liked about it was that at least the way Zen was presented to me by my teachers, it didn't try to compete with mainstream science. It wasn't trying to say, uh, science is wrong, listen to us, which is the Hare Krishnas did that all the time, which I'd already had enough of with the Christians who did that, you know, Christians who insist that the world is 6,000 years old and, and uh, that uh, Noah's uh, flood really happened, and that the Grand Canyon is evidence of the flood, and that you find uh, human footprints alongside dinosaur footprints. I actually went to the place uh, when my dad used to live in Texas, Gosh, I can't remember the name of the place, but there's a place that was about two hours drive from him where you could see dinosaur footprints. And there was a competing place down the street which claimed that they also had dinosaur footprints alongside human footprints, which proved that uh, the Bible was right and so forth and so on. So, uh, and I went and looked at them and I was like, I don't know if those are human footprints. <laughs> it was just some little marks in the rock that they were claiming. The dinosaur footprints were very clear, but the the so-called human footprints could have been just about any sort of weird mark in the rock. So uh, I wasn't, I didn't think they really had all their, uh, their, uh, you know, their evidence that was going to prove everything was right, you know, in the Bible. But, but I never liked that kind of thing. And, and I thought, well, you know, if the Buddhists are going to do the same damn thing, I'm not going to follow them. But luckily I found Buddhists who weren't into that. You know, they didn't try to challenge science. They weren't saying science was wrong. They accepted it, but they also kind of had a place for it. You know, science operates within trying to understand the workings of the law of cause and effect within the material world. Like, so if you take the Buddhist worldview, you can, you can slot science into it and say, we don't have to deny this stuff or fight against it because we have a place for this. It, it is cause and effect relationships within the material world. So, so yes, it's a really good way of studying that, but uh, as Dogen says, the universe abounds far beyond that. So I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. And, and I want to know more about that. Uh, so yeah, um, meditation as science, I think is kind of a, a little bit of a dubious endeavor. And it always kind of, it's always a little bit shaky because you never know, you know, you might have a study that proves that meditation is wonderful, but then you have another study that proves it's bad. Like like the one that, that keeps getting sent to me every six to nine months, somebody sends me the works of, what's her name, Willoughby Britton, I think is her name. And she's a person I actually think is, is uh, worth hearing out and worth listening to, but one of the things she likes to point out is that meditation isn't always good for you. And she's on the side of, of science and she's seen a lot of times when meditation has gone wrong for people and that it's maybe not for everybody or maybe it requires a certain amount of training that you you shouldn't just uh, jump into it without knowing anything about it or you shouldn't try to make it you know, shoehorn it into a, a psychological model uh, because the psychological model doesn't really have a place for some of the things that can happen to you in meditation some of the freaky things I've uh, talked about this in numerous times on this video channel and I've talked about it in my books and written about it in blogs and places so I, I'm sorry I can't tell you where <laughs> because I can't I don't have that good of a memory but if you look up my stuff you can see where I've talked about it and other people have talked about it so there are these things that can happen I think one of my videos was called like the dangers of meditation so if you want to look for that one uh, I talked about that aspect of it and there are uh, there can be dangers in meditation depending on who you are and how you work with it so 
you know, the idea of science proving that meditation is wonderful for everybody and that psychologists can just uh, read a paragraph or two about how to teach their stu- their uh, patients to meditate and then everything will be fine. It's probably not. You, you kind of need that Buddhist worldview, which I think I like to characterize as research and development. It's, it's a research and development into what works and what doesn't when it comes to meditation. And it's there's 2,500 years of it through uh, several countries, through India, Korea, China, Japan, uh, elsewhere, Sri Lanka, all these places. A lot of people in a lot of different cultures have worked out what works best uh, for meditators. And I don't think we should throw that away because it is expressed in language that we find to be religious or superstitious. You might want to put it in different terms in order to make people accept it uh, here in the West, but uh, we shouldn't throw it away. Anyway, I guess that was a bit of a garbled uh, thing, and I hope uh, I hope it was at least entertaining. Uh, so, uh, as I've been saying, I'm going to Europe uh, in a couple of weeks, and here are the dates. I'll put them up here, and then I'll put them up at the end of the video again. Uh, so, all of these events are open to whoever wants to come. Uh, so, please uh, sign up. You can go to my page, hardcorezen.info slash events. That is hardcore or zen.info slash events. There you will find clickable versions of the links that you're seeing on the screen and you can actually contact the people who are organizing these events if you want to go. So please do that. Uh, Also, as always, uh, this video channel and my work is supported mainly by you out there, you viewers out there. And you can go to the URL you're seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info slash donate. That is hardcorezen.info slash donate. There you will find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts. That's my main way of making a living and I appreciate your support, but you don't got to support me if you don't want to support me. Anyway, I always say that. Uh, we will see you next time. You like this neon Godzilla shirt? I got this at uh, Anime. Was it Anime Con? I think it was called a big thing about Japanese animation in uh, Los Angeles. Thought that was kind of cool. Uh, we will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Bye. How you doing, buddy? You got a bath, didn't you? Yeah. He doesn't like that. He does pretty good with baths. But uh, he actually really loves the toweling off at the end. Like, even if I say the word towel, hey Ziggy, towel. He's, he, he's at the towel. Uh, but he loves getting toweled off. But you can't really tell, but he's really clean right now. Anyway, see you later, Ziggy. Bye.